Hey everybody. So in this screencast, recording, whatever it is, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull back the curtain a little bit and we'll talk about what happens when your Kotlin code is actually executed. Um, and, you know, so far, you know, you've been running code in our playgrounds and in the homework uh, environment. And when that happens, there's a couple of steps that get sort of merged together. And so what I want to do here is detangle those two steps. And, and doing that sort of requires showing you a couple of new tools, right, that you don't really even realize are being used, um, but things that are happening sort of behind the scenes uh, when your Kotlin code runs, right? Um, so I'm in an environment here that's called uh, the, the terminal. Um, this is a different uh, user interface for interacting with your computer. But what we're going to do is pretty familiar. We're going to write some Kotlin code and we're going to run it um, and, and see what happens. Um, so I'm going to open up a file. I'm going to call this um, uh, main.kt and I'm going to write some code in here. This is a, a Kotlin file. Uh, you probably are going to write a function called main and I'm going to do uh, println hello world. Okay. Uh, and I'm going to write that uh, and then I'm going to, and then we're going to talk about, so this is a command that will show me the contents of the file. You can see that this file now contains this Kotlin method, a single method, uh, main method. And that's kind of important, um, but we'll talk about why in a sec. So how do I actually get this code to run? Some of you are familiar with, you know, programming languages like Python, in which case there would be a single command that would allow me to run this code directly. But that's not true when we're using Kotlin. There's actually two steps here, four steps, two steps, two steps uh, that get performed. The first one is a step called compilation. So when the code is compiled, there's a process for taking that text, that high level Kotlin code that we wrote and transforming it into a different uh, format. Now you can think of it as taking the string, essentially the contents of the file are essentially a string and there's a program that transforms that string into some other data that's then used when the program is run. And I'll talk about sort of why there are two steps for doing this in a second. But let's actually perform those two steps and see what happens. So in order to compile the code, we're going to use a program called Kotlin C. And what I do to run Kotlin C is I type the name of the command and then I give it the file that I want to compile. And so when I compile this code, you see that you know, it's going to think for a second um, and then it's going to finish. But you'll see that nothing happened. There was nothing printed. My code says to print hello world, but nothing was printed. So what did happen? Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a command that's going to list the files in the directory. And what you see is that before I had this file called main.kt that I was using to write my code. And now I actually also have a file called mainkt.class. Now, if I try to open up that file, I, I might as well show you what happens, right? So if I try to open uh, mainkt.class, you're going to see that it's gibberish, right? You can see some strings in here and things like that. Um, sorry, Gracie is uh, getting excited, I think, because there's a storm coming in. Um, so there's some strings here, uh, but most of this is not text, right? It's actually a different format that we can't read as humans. Uh, it's, it's in a, a format that a computer can interpret. So how do I execute this? Well, now we have to talk a little bit about Kotlin and our operating with Java. So Kotlin is a new language, uh, but part of the way that Kotlin has got such a great start is by interoperating with Java. And the level at which it interoperates on Java with Java is actually quite deep in the sense that Kotlin, when you compile Kotlin code, what you get is something called Java bytecode. And so to run this, I'm actually going to use a program called Java. And now when I run this, you see it prints hello world. So what we've illustrated here are two steps. So given some Kotlin code, there are two steps that I need to complete to before it actually runs, right? Now, in the playground, we combine these two together really quickly so you don't notice them, but these two steps are important uh, for understanding sort of particularly some of Kotlin's important features, okay? And there's two different places where errors can occur. There are compilation errors, and then there are runtime errors. So there are errors that happen when the code is compiled, and then there are errors that happen when the code is executed, okay? 
So the two steps that I just described, the first step happened when I ran this Kotlin C program. This is compilation. So let's do this again. Let me change the, the, the program, right? So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna edit main.kt and let's say, hello, uh, Gracie. Gracie is our new dog. I knew I'd be able to work on this example somehow. So one of the things, so let me point out one thing. So first of all, if I just run the compiled code again, you'll see it still prints hello world. The reason is I need to compile that source file again in order to change the way the program works. So whenever I change the code, I actually have to recompile it. And then when I execute it, you'll see it prints a different message. So let's run these two steps again. So we're gonna run uh, Kotlin C, which is going to compile the code. And you'll notice that the Kotlin compiler is not particularly speedy. Um, and then now I run Java and now you'll see that the new message is printed. So let's talk about the, the one of the things that we really wanna understand here is the difference between what's called a compilation error that occurs when the code is compiled and a runtime error that occurs when the code runs. So in Kotlin uh, and in other languages, there's particular types of errors that occur when the code is compiled, okay? So I'm gonna remove this main kt.class file and I'm gonna edit main.kt again. So I'll show you a variety of different compilation errors. So one type of compilation error is a simple syntax error, right? So in this case, I remove that brace from the beginning of my method, and I no longer have a valid uh, piece of Kotlin code. When I try to compile it, what we're gonna see is that there's gonna be an error message printed that indicates that the compiler uh, really has no idea what to do with this code. And this is the problem, you know, um, there's rules about how computer code is structured, and if you break them, frequently the compiler really has no idea what to do when you get this long you know, list of, of error messages that can be very difficult to, to, to figure out what to do with, right? Okay, so let's fix that, right? And, and there's a whole variety of syntax errors that can cause this problem. You know, if I forgot a, you know, a, a closing quote, I would have a similar problem uh, when I try to compile the code. Um, and, you know, they get the same thing. And what I want to point out is when this happens, there's no uh, result. So when the comp compilation step fails, I can't execute the code. There's no way to execute it. So when you try to compile the code and it doesn't compile, there's nothing to execute, right? You have to fix the compilation errors before the code will run. Um, okay, so, so let's fix uh, these syntax errors. So let me introduce a different type of error. And this will be a fun one because we're gonna use an error that comes up when we work with null in Kotlin. So this is one of Kotlin's really nice features. Well, let's create a nullable string variable and let's initialize it to null. And then let's try to print its length in an unsafe way. So Kotlin knows that this variable can store a null. And if you remember our lesson about null, when I have a variable that can store a null, I can't just use the dot operator on it because Kotlin knows that it could be null and it's gonna require that I work with it safely. So if I try to compile this code, now this is not a syntax error. Kotlin understands what I'm trying to do, but the compiler still isn't going to let the code compile because it's detected a problem. And so this is something about Kotlin that's a real strength of the language is that the Kotlin compiler can determine a lot of things about our code. They can help us uh, eliminate mistakes. And eliminating mistakes during compilation is super valuable because comp compilation is something that only developers do, right? The developer, the, the user of the code never compiles it, they only run it. So any mistakes that we can catch in compilation that don't then happen when the code is executed are huge wins. Because when there's a problem when the code is executed, typically what happens is the program crashes and users don't like that, right? If you try to, let's say you install something with the Play Store and you open it up on your phone and it crashes immediately, what are you gonna do? My first thing I do is uninstall, right? Cause I just think this is buggy software and um, it's probably not gonna work very well, right? I can't even get it to open, right? Don't worry, we'll work, you know, when you guys start writing your own apps, you'll create plenty of programs that will crash immediately and, and you'll develop some sympathy for, for app developers. Okay, so let's fix this problem. So let's use this, um, this null safe uh, operator. And now you'll see that the code will compile, right? Only when the code compiles do I end up with something that I can actually run, right? So now again, I can run Java main KT and you'll see null and then hello Gracie, right? Because null was printed first, right? 
So this is this first step, which is called compilation. So compilation transforms your Kotlin source code into this uh, format called Java bytecode that can be then run by this Java program. Now, why is this, why do we do this, right? Why do we compile the code? Why not just run it immediately? Well, there's a couple of reasons. The first reason is because the compilation step, as I've described, actually includes a number of really important checks that the compiler does on your code to try to make sure it's correct. And we've seen one example of this. Uh, wait, hold on a sec, let me open this up. But you know, there's all sorts of other things that, that we can do, right? So let's, let's create a variable that stores a string, and then we'll try to save an int into it. This is another example of the type of error message that the Kotlin compiler, uh, or the type of error that the Kotlin compiler can flag, right? Because it says, look, you set this up, that you set up this variable s to store strings, but now you're storing an int into it. This is probably a mistake, right? This is the type of thing that Python cannot do, right? Python does typically does not have enough information about your program to perform even basic checks like this. Python is like, oh, okay. I mean, I guess that variable had a string in it a minute ago, and now it has an int in it, and that's fine. Uh, I hope, right? Um, and so that this compilation step really increases the ability of Kotlin and the computer you're working with to help you debug your own programs, right? So, you know, one of the things I want you to recognize is that computers, as they become faster and faster and more powerful, you know, one of the problems that computers are helping humans solve is writing better computer code more quickly, right? So we can solve more problems and change the world faster, right? Computers are helping us with that. And to the degree they can help us find problems in our programs that mean that we can write code that's correct right more quickly and it won't crash and it won't frustrate people that's really a good thing right so Kotlin has taken some major steps forward in this area okay so that's a description of compilation um, uh, and so but I was talking about sort of why we do this right so the first reason is it helps right it helps us find bugs it helps us find problems the second reason is um, it turns out that this file this file here main kt dot class I could send that to anybody in the world who has Java installed and they could run it on their computer. So the, uh, the process of compilation produces this artifact, this output that is very portable, right? Anyone who has Java installed and Java is installed on like billions of devices all over the world, anyone who has Java installed can run this program. Um, and that's something about, that was something that was sort of a very exciting part about the design of Java. I don't want to go too far down this rabbit hole, but one of the things that was very revolutionary about Java when it was introduced was this particular component, right? Uh, the, the phrase they used to use was write once, run anywhere. So any developer can create code that can be run by anybody else on the planet. And I can't tell you exactly why that's so revolutionary without going into a bunch of details that you'll learn about probably in some of your later courses that have to do with hardware architecture and all sorts of other things. But um, the point is that at the time and still today, that was pretty revolutionary. This idea that you could create a program that literally almost anybody on earth could run and it would work the same way, right? That was a pretty exciting, uh, exciting idea. Um, and so that's the other reason that we compile code is to uh, take this source code and transform it into this other representation. And you can actually see how powerful that is if you just think about the fact that, you know, we're teaching both Java and so, so there are multiple languages that will compile into this Java bytecode. Java source code compiles into Java bytecode, but Kotlin source code also compiles to Java bytecode. There's a language called Scala. That's another completely different programming language, but also compiles into Java bytecode. Um, and there's a bunch of other languages as well that also compile into Java bytecode. And so they all interoperate with Java. So this has sort of become a little bit of a standard. Anyway, so I'm, I'm starting to uh, go off on a tangent here, but I'll stop. Uh, and then we'll talk in the next video about execution, which is the next stage uh, of, of the process.